Welcome to this week's Master Coaches Weekly Buzz, hosted by our friend and colleague, John Foreman. We continue to update our viewers on the most current issues and trends during our conversations with leaders in our sport. Our Journey of the Legends series was created to inspire, motivate, educate, and most importantly, to provide insight into their career while you travel with them through time. How many can say you have spent over 40 years in this sport, continue to love and have passion, and continue to pay it forward? Now, let's go to four-time Hall of Famer and former Olympic coach Mick Haley, who will introduce our Journey of the Legends guest today. Mick? Thank you, Ruth. And, of course, it's more than my pleasure to introduce you, Ruth Nelson, as as our guest today, um, you know, Ruth, Ruth has been a uh, three-time Division I coach, three different schools. She's been the assistant USA coach. She has done a number of things from development to business uh, all over the world. And, and so we're so excited uh, to have, have a chance to poke at you a little bit today, Ruth, because uh, I don't think people know what you've been up to uh, for the past few years. And uh, I, I, for one, am excited, uh, excited to have you on so we can do this. So are you ready? Are you ready to uh, take us on here? <laughs> I was just thinking that if there wasn't social media, you still wouldn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> that that might be true, but I did follow you uh, for a long time. So way back when, when you started college, you started at Northern Colorado. Why why Northern Colorado? Colorado? Well, actually, there were three schools I was admitted to because they had great physical education programs. One was Long Beach State, one was San Jose State, and one was Colorado State College that later began University of Northern Colorado. So I picked a physical education school. And so is that how you then got to George Williams College for your graduate work? Well, long story short, I met Bill McKenzie when I was in Denver. And I actually happened to mosey through going through Chicago on my way back after I had graduated from University of Northern Colorado. I was teaching in a private tennis camp in Franconia, New Hampshire. And I stopped there and... Uh, Jim Coleman said, would you be interested in going to graduate school? And I go, no, I'm not really interested. You know, I, I just really, you know, you had enough at school. And I was into tennis and, you know, it was right next to the Rod Laver camp. And I was teaching private tennis lessons. And really, my background was really tennis coming out of high school. So it, I ended up saying, hey, on my way back, I'll stop by and we'll talk about it. And that's how I ended up at George Williams College. So most people don't know about George Williams College because it doesn't exist anymore, but it was one of the foremost YMCA training schools at one time uh, in downtown Chicago. When I actually played for Ball State, we played at the downtown branch, uh, and they had a men's team that uh, was extremely good nationally. Then they moved out to Napersville uh, out on the west side of Chicago, uh, built a campus out there, and that's when you you came to George Williams, and Jim Coleman was an instructor out there, and and he did some really amazing things. I can see now if you were interested in education and teaching, going to George Williams gave you opportunities because Coleman um, turned you loose, right? What what did he encourage you to do? Well, everything. Uh, absolutely. But when I, on my way back, I have to tell you the story. He says, well, we got your resume. We got your information, your recommendations from University of Northern Colorado and wanted to know, are you bringing your family with you? And I said, bringing my family with me? And, they, and he said, well, it shows here that you're married and you have two kids and that you're 34 years old. And I said, no, I'm 21 years old. I don't have a family. They sent the wrong Ruth N. Nelson credentials to him. So that's how, that was how I started. And then Jim says, hey, look, what, what can you teach? And I said, I'll teach, you know, any classes except gymnastics and swimming. And so I taught all the other classes, coached men's tennis. Of course, I had to prove myself by beating the number one men's singles player first because, you know, men aren't going to respect women coaching them. And then I coached the women's volleyball team. And guess what? 50% of them were older than I was. 
<laughs> so that was interesting at age 21 where you're going to tell a 23 year old what to do and luckily though I had played some in college but I had played all the other sports so Jim just kind of let me do all of that and he was my advisor which I was privileged because he was a volleyball fanatic you know you think every summer you remember coming to camp and we did coaches clinics and everybody came from all over the country and you went eight to ten hours a day for camp we first started video training where you would go around and go station to station and Jerry Angle would be at one station Vineyard would be at another station and you would video the person and then you would analyze it and that was we're talking about in the 70s and people weren't doing it then I mean we had a big old TV on a rack you had those big old tapes you have to read and then all and then you get done with camp and then you got to play for two to three hours because Jim wanted to play but remember, we wanted replay, so we stretched the tape 15 feet, and by the time that it got to the next player, that was your that's time to turn and look and see what you just did. So oh. you were you were in the middle of the biggest innovation in in sports uh, ever. Uh, a couple of things you had Russ Rose and Bill Willie Walton in yeah. uh, in badminton class. Is that right? Russ was in my badminton class. I, you know, I think back on that. And you know what he said one time? He says, I got an A, didn't I? And I said, you think whatever you want to think. <laughs> but he was in my badminton class. And Bill was a basketball player at George yeah, Williams. he was. And I talked to him, and he was shooting baskets one time. We're getting ready to set up. And I said, why don't you play the good sport? Forget about that sport. He says, no, nah, I, don't, I don't think so. And I said, well, first of all, you need to learn how to play defense, so we've get, got to get knee pads on you. So I'd hit balls at him, and he just kind of laughed at me. And, you know, it was th that experience alone, just having the opportunity to not only, but that's where my career started in setting, you know, because Jim taught me in setting. He got me to go to Kmart to buy a plastic volleyball. I brought it back. I went into the lab because, remember, he was a chemistry teacher, Dr. James Coleman. We took a hypodermic needle. We shoved in water halfway in the ball, so every time you set, the ball was swishing, and you had to stabilize your hands. So he taught me really how to set, and then, hey, I got to go to men's practice at nighttime on the Kenneth Allen team, and that's when I played when you were setting. You were setting at a center back, and everybody says, what does setter set at a center back? Oh, yeah, they do, because he, Mick was quick and Tom Beerman. But I got to play around great players. I got to play beach with the best on mixed so I really learned so much about the game because Jim never in all my years did he ever say anything bad about anybody he loved the sport he helped anybody and he developed us with the history with Jane Ward in the Olympics Smitty Duke he always talked about Smitty Duke so there was you know if you got someone teaching you the history I mean just think of how much love and passion you have and the fact is this, you know, I couldn't block on a men's net. Yeah, I had a pretty good jump, 28 inches. But, hey, you play defense, you learned all those things. You know, uh, you mentioned Bill McKenzie. Uh, he was a teammate of mine uh, on Kenneth Allen. And we trained with Coleman there at George Williams College. And I would drive from Battle Creek, Michigan, three hours over to practice three hours and then three hours back every Wednesday night. Uh, that's, how, that's how much we wanted to play. And... So you talked about Beerman, you talked about myself, you talked about uh, Bill uh, McKenzie. All three of us were setters. Uh, Bill was the best blocker. Beerman was the best athlete. Uh, I don't know why I was involved there, but uh, it, was, it was pretty fun. But you got to be part of all of that. And Jim Coleman was the 1968 Olympic coach. So he was bringing everybody, everybody, all the information he had garnered from training in Poland and playing in the uh, 68 Olympics in Mexico City. So with all of that, you couldn't just go into coaching. So were you playing during the 70s also? You yes. became the first coach at George Williams College, okay, and you were 21 years old, and you were coaching the women's team. And uh, were you still playing throughout the 70s? Because the rest yes. of us were Actually, trying to play okay, and coach now. at the same time. In college, I played five sports. Okay, we were in the quarter system, and I played field hockey and volleyball during the fall. I played and tennis. In winter, I played basketball and tennis. 
And then springtime, I played softball and tennis. So tennis was an all-year-round sport. So actually, my graduating three and a half years, not because I was smart, I just went to summer school and took 17, 18 hours and did my student teaching in Denver. But I used to drive back and forth from Greeley to Denver to play with the firebugs. And I called them the old ladies. Well, you know what? I'm in that category now. So I played with them, and then I went to Chicago, and then I played on the national team in 72. I met Mary Jo in Maryland then, and I actually gave Mary Jo some tennis lessons. And for those people who don't know Mary Jo, I mean, my gosh, during the 70s, 60s, and 70s, she was probably one of the best players in the world, the left-handed, one of the first women yeah. superstars. Mary Jo Pepler, Mary yeah. Jo Pepler, and Marilyn McCreevy. Yep. And then uh, played for the Chicago Rebels. And then Mary Jo and Marilyn invited me to come to Houston to play for E Pluribus Unum, EPU. And that's how I got to Houston. But yes, I and still that, on the national team. And e EPU was famous. Uh, that means six in unity, incidentally. That's, that's what EPU <laughs> means in Latin, six in unity. Uh -huh. pretty, pretty interesting history there. So you're doing all of these things, uh, and I hope John Foreman's paying attention because it's not <laughs> that tough to multitask, all right? Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just thrilled that we got a chance to let people know all the things that, uh, that you have done in your past, along with a number <laughs> of other people that, that were growing with you. I'm going to uh, bring Bob Bertucci in because he has some special – uh, things he remembers, uh, and he wants to question you about. Bob, why don't you take over? Bob, be careful right, thanks, now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to talk about E Pluribus Unum, though. <laughs> though I do, I do remember that volleyball house and 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 uh, and, and a fun time being a volleyball camp down there. Uh, but I'm going to jump to the '80s real quick. Uh, when you were at LSU last week, Ruth, you paid me a a, a, a great compliment talking about me as a program developer. And, and I, I felt like I've done that over the years, taking different programs and, and you know, either starting them or develop, develop, developing them or rebuilding them. Uh, you're also a program developer. So for, for the young coaches that might be listening, what are the, the key steps in developing a program? Well, I let me diverge just to Houston because that was really you know developing stage. I was playing with the national team uh, at the same time I was as I was coaching at Houston, and I was there until '80. And you know we finished. You know it's like I told you guys last week. You know people at AIW, which is Intercollegiate Athletics for Women, uh, people don't even know we didn't have Final Four, but we were in the Final Four. So we were third. Actually, Brian, by the way. You weren't there, but we beat Long Beach State at Princeton University and uh, knocked them out in flow, made an air. She hit the back wall, and she came to the sideline. And for those of you who don't know who Flo Hyman was, you need to Google her because she was one of the best players in the world. It passed away with a Marfan syndrome. And she hit one at the back, came to the, uh, the line to get – I said, what are you doing? Now, remember, I'm playing and coaching her. I play in the national team with her, and then she comes – so Houston calls me Miss Nelson because, you know, when you're young, you got to have them call you Miss, you know, so they don't get too close to you. And she says, I'm subbing out. I said, no, you're not subbing out. So then we moved to, I moved on to LSU because I felt like developing the program. I felt like I had gotten a change in administration. So these young coaches that are out there understand probably the most important thing is who's your AD? Who actually do you report to? What red flags do you always look at when you know you need to be doing something different? Have great mentors, have great role models, and make sure that you understand what your administration wants. So I felt like at Houston, after Cedric Dempsey came, he used to be at UOP and he was fantastic. He changed everything. We actually got to sleep two girls to the room, not four and six. And he changed that program. And I felt like when he left, Houston was a little bit different. So I chose, well, I actually played at regionals at LSU, AIW. It was called Southwestern, S-W-A-I-W, at the time where you were at Tennessee. And I was walked in, and we're getting ready to play regional tournament. And that's in 1980, my last year at Houston. And we, I walk in, and they don't even have the nets up, and we're supposed to start in 30 minutes. Well, guess what? 
you know we could never put lines on basketball courts, right? Not until the last minute. You don't touch putting anything. You had to make sure you had 3M tape so it didn't lay anything on the floor for men's basketball. So I told the AD, I said, can we put up the lines? And she goes, well, you guys know how to do it? Well, yeah, we could do it in seven and a half minutes. We could do two courts. <laughs> I mean, we put those tapes down. We took our shoes off, took our socks, and went down and laid those, and we're ready to play. And the AD comes over and says, I want to offer you the job here at LSU. And I, said, huh. I said, you can't afford me. And so she, Mick, he just, he just passed out on that. <laughs> and she said, you can't afford me. Well, I ended up, she offered me the job. I took the job after the first year at LSU. I decided to develop because I wanted to develop programs because, you know, it's fun to develop programs because guess what? Whatever you did at George Williams or whatever you did at Houston, you can now change. You could be tougher. You could be more lax. You could have different protocol. It's fun to change because a lot of times when you try to change within your own program, it's very difficult because the players don't really want to adapt to that. So I felt like in the 80s, you know, I think probably when I got to LSU, you know, it was like, how do I get my information out to the media? So we used to, every kid came play for me had to bring a 10 speed bicycle because that was part of their training. They had to bring a swimsuit because we jumped in the pool, you know, called a aquatic resistance training. Every place I've gone, we've done that. And so they would ride around as their warm up, but they had to take 50 flyers with them in their backpack and they had to put them on cars on campus. And so that was the way we kind of did that. And when we did Christmas cards, oh, my goodness, we did Christmas cards at LSU. Everybody sat around the table. We'd send out 100 Christmas cards with my autograph. But developing the program, what do you have to do? You have to, one, you've got to make sure no different than what happened before. You had to recruit. Well, guess what? All you guys know, we never, I never had an assistant coach at Houston for eight years. I'm going to LSU, and I got a part-time assistant and a part-time manager. Well, you got to go and recruit. You got to figure out what to look for. You got, and you're doing the majority of time. I mean, you're doing all these home visits. Like Brian talked about home visits with Debbie and Mick talked about these home visits. Hey, you got to know those people. So <coughs> then what did you do? We developed a system in which we had to have money. Okay, so the first year, '81 Hawaii Nationals, I parked myself in the bar. Okay, in the corner, not to drink. Not to buy people drink, but I'm doing my scheduling, and I've got two hundred thousand dollars in guarantees. I know don't think anybody else had that much money to give out guarantees. We brought in in four years at LSU. We played eighteen of the top twenty-three teams in the country. We established the classic, the showcase. We started Tiger Vision, and we had the camera come from above, and we had the players, and it was all those things that people are talking about that are our givens now, we had to develop those. So you talk about develop. Hey, Bob, I think you should have been, there should have been a coach's portal for you, all the numbers <laughs> you've been at. But that kind of gives you on how to develop a program at LSU. And I just think the other thing too is probably one main important thing for people out there. If you have a change in administration, guess what? You might get fired. So I got fired at LSU. After four years at LSU, the first person who called me, no, actually a second person, Dale Flickinger called me from USC, and he says, Ruth, you're not the first person that got fired. I got fired. I said, Dale, you're a volunteer. Yeah, you don't get fired as a volunteer. Next, Mick called me, and he tried to talk me into staying in coaching, and I said, Mick, I don't want nothing to do with it. Don't give me any. I don't want to deal with any players. I don't want to deal with any of that. And I said, hey, I'm done. Well, Guess what? Two years later, I'm coaching the Dallas Bells. Well, besides being a program developer, and I think you've already started touching on some of the things, you, you've, you've really been an innovator in, in the sport of volleyball. And, you know, I, I, and not just off the court. You mentioned a bunch of things you know, around the program as an innovator. But I, I even think in the day and age where it seems like everybody just copies whatever the national team might be doing. Or, or whatever the, you know, the flavor of the day might be, uh, opposed to thinking on their own and, and developing, you know, tactics and, and strategy based on what their situation is. I can remember when you were at LSU, uh, where you had, I think it was two left-handers uh, on your team, 
and you started running a system with the center <laughs> penetrating from the left back, all right, and passing to to the left front, so you could so they could be on hand all the time when you're setting it. You know, talk a little bit about you know being an innovator in the sport and and, and thinking outside the box some. And that was one example I, I remember, and I, I thought that was pretty interesting. Well, somebody once asked me about six years ago, and they said, Ruth, why don't you just do what everybody else does and just do it better? And I said, well, I don't agree with what they're doing. I mean, very simple. So you have to decide, you know, what it is that you believe in. So I think the one part I thought of, okay, when you're on the right, we pass to the right side. When you're on the left, you pass to the left side. I like the idea of mixing up the offense because it allowed you to score when maybe we didn't have, I, I don't think I've ever had volleyball players that were polished like, you know, Mick, you know, you had, Brian, you had. I had to develop a heck of a lot of players during that time. And I felt like if I gave them the option to be able to get one-on-one, -on -one, then I could be very innovative in that sense. I mean, no different than me developing the first volleyball shoe, the Ruth Nelson side out shoe that was the official shoe for NIA. I mean, I believe that everybody has some qualities and mine has always been creativity and innovation and what things, you know, like what could we do with Tiger Vision? What could we do with the showcase? What could we do with the classic? What things can you do to make the sport better? Not what things can Ruth do that's different than everybody else. And I just think that you have to think about that. I mean, I don't know why we never jump serve. I mean, we used to practice it with Mary Jo jumping from the inline and serving, but we never did it. But we did tandem block. We did swing block. And, you know, we did a lot of those things. I would go and travel with the national team for over 10 years. And I'd come back. And Rose said to me the other day, Ruth, how did you ever keep us busy for eight hours? Because remember, we had no limit on the number of hours you could train. <laughs> Not 20 hours. She goes, how did you do that and never do the same drill within that period of time? And I used to swing a ball, and they had to jump and dive over it, and they had to do all, all right. and they go, Real they laugh drills. when I would come back because they go, okay, they, no, they didn't tell me until now. Well, I wonder what we're going to have to do now. I tried it, what I saw, and if it was effective, I continued it. If I didn't think it was effective I didn't do it but I tried it again during the springtime because remember during the springtime you guys maybe hey I got to play with my college team I got to play on the same team with them during the off season and I basically fundraised and I ended up paying ten thousand dollars a year to play for my off season program me personally so you know you got to think of ways that your team can get better because I was wanting to beat Mick you know, in Texas when I got to LSU, did we beat him? No, but we paid their way over. You know, I gave him a free ride. So he <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, I, I think we just need to have more innovative thinking in the sport with the idea of always trying to make, make it, a, you know, a better sport and move it forward. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and throw this over to, to Brian. I'm sure he's waiting to ask a couple of questions too. So, Brian? Well, Ruth, uh, we're running short about time, but I think we got up till the 90s. I think we're, <laughs> we're going to have to go three weeks with you, I think. But uh, we're, we're in 19, around 1990. Just update everybody where you were and what you actually uh, changed uh, from coaching to another field. Why don't you give, give us the background to that? Well, even starting in 81, I had my own business. So that's how I ended up paying. Actually, the IRS, you can pull it up on Google. You can IRS me, and you can see And I had a case that they said I had a hobby, not a profession. So, <laughs> you know, I had to go to court and do that. But I've always been in business. I've done fundraising. I actually worked for Acadian Advertising, which I basically marketed different types of products. Like when you go to a golf tournament and you see United Companies or somebody on an umbrella, oh, I can't tell you how many umbrellas I sold and how many Piccadilly cafeteria trays I designed. And... <laughs> Then I left Iowa after two years. I was color commentating there. Then I moved to Special Olympics full time. All right, now I'd done Special Olympics in 1981 when LSU basically hosted the International Special Olympic Games and all my players at Houston that used to be coaching, I invited them back over to LSU to do the games. And that's where I met Eunice Kennedy Shriver. 
And I actually, one of my players came over, Leah Bennett, and said, hey, there's some lady that's on the court. Can you come over and tell her to get off the court? And I said, well, I'll come over. And I said, look, you know, ma'am, you really need to go get your credentials. And um, you really, then you come back, but you don't have the right kind of shoes because we're at LSU, right? Dale Brown would never let us get on there with black sole shoes, you know. And she goes, I just want to tell you, my name is Eunice Kennedy Shriver, and I'm going to have everybody do security just like you. And I met her in 81, and I went full-time as the sports and corporate marketing director and worked with Special Olympics, developed the uh, volleyball program for Special Olympics for volleyball, and then I did the sports and corporate marketing, and that my responsibility was Adidas, John, and I made sure that when we did the inaugural parade with Clinton that I had Adidas jackets on Hillary and Bill as they marched, and Carl Lewis was with us, and then I did, I was a bodyguard in Barcelona for Arnold, you know, importante personas, you know, and so you're in Special Olympics, and, you know, I watched the Pointer Sisters, you know, go, come down the slope in Austria as I did the World Winter Games. I knew nothing about the World Winter Games, but I knew Special Olympics, and I was in charge of corporate sponsorships. So every day that the Austrian government would put up Austrian Airlines, I went up and took it down and put Delta Airlines up there. <laughs> Every time they put up, you know, you know, Nike, I had to put Adidas up. So I went into the corporate marketing side, and then I moved to Dallas, and then I kept in the prepaid phone card business. That's what Mick said. He says, hey, what are you doing in the prepaid phone? Hey, nobody knew what they were. So I did the official phone card for USA Volleyball. For the first bag tags that they actually have now, I did a phone card. I was the first one that did that. And then I loved the phone card business. John Elway, Julie Foudy, I did prepaid. You know, you got autograph cards. You go out to dinner with them. Then I went back into coaching full-time. And then now guess where I am? BYOP. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, I don't know why you're hanging around with us when you had a chance to hang around with all those people. But I'm going to turn this back. <laughs> I'm going to turn this back over to Mick. I think he has a few more questions. Mick? Well, very, very quickly, uh, uh, Adidas in uh, Europe is now Adidas in the United States. So yes. that's, a, that's the first thing you might want to throw back at them. Uh, but Ruth, 71, you're 21 years old. You got your first coaching job. And now we're 2000, and you've done this for 30 years. And all at once, you decide to kind of slow down on the business thing and get back into coaching, do some international stuff, and do some international training. Give us a quick overview of that, that decade. Well, I think that when you develop a love and passion and you have the right mentors and followers and you, and you have role models, they help you develop that love and passion. And once I was out, and I really was kind of not out, I was doing Special Olympics volleyball still, and I just, I, I missed some of the training aspects, and I had a parent say, hey, look, we'll do exactly what you say. We'll set up the court. We'll, uh, we'll gather the money. Uh, we'll get all the parents that will agree to everything you say. And I thought, oh, that sounds like a great idea, you know, <laughs> everybody agree. So I got back into training, and then all of a sudden I said to myself, hey, don't you think that a 5- through 10-year-old kid deserves someone that has a lot of experience and that loves to teach? So I got into BYOP, and actually in 2007 when I was at IED, uh, and it's a facility that's a $42 million facility, and I went on full-time and started testing some of these things. And actually, Ebony was one of the first ones in 2003 that kind of came through the program. But the idea is that, that mom or dad comes with the kid, and you, you don't get to drop them off. Everybody tried to convince me to drop them off, but I'm not going to drop them off. But I love the sport. I love teaching. And you guys invited me to be part of your events, which allowed me to also showcase my volleyball background, but also to showcase my love in, in the teaching side of BYOP. Well, Bob, well, Ruth, what do you think uh, of yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, she just proves the, the point of a program developer and innovator. I mean, <laughs> you know, BYOP and Go Kids, uh, you know, m the most innovative. Uh, youth training program for, for the sport out there. Uh, you know, it's just great to have you, you know, still involved and, and continue to do stuff to advance the game of volleyball, especially with the youngest people in our country. Uh, you know, I'd like to go ahead and just, uh, you know, we're starting to run out of time. So 
uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about next week. Uh, you know, we have a, a, a interesting program for next week, especially with, you know, everything that's happening with the virus. Uh, and it's going to be called Here Are the Facts. Uh, and we're all going to address, you know, the latest updates on the college game, you know, the high school game and the club sports. So hopefully everybody that was listening this week will be back again next week because I think we'll have some, some breaking news that's going to happen over the next couple of days. Uh, and I started assembling some of that stuff, uh, you know, in the last few days uh, with the last conference EIVA meeting we just had yesterday. And, and, and we had John Spra on talking about the men's national program. So, I, you know, I'm sure we all will have a lot of stuff to, to uh, address, you know, here are the facts for next week. So, you know, I'd like to, you know, finish up with that and th throw it back to you, Ruth. Okay. Hey, thanks, guys. I'm glad you didn't ask me any embarrassing questions. <laughs> all right. Now, a special shout out to all those coaches that have attended one of our championship skills series clinics. For those interested in hosting a master coach's virtual clinic or a in-person clinic in 2021, please contact us at www.volleyballmastercoaches.com. Join us next week for Master Coaches Weekly Buzz and follow us on Facebook, Volleyball Master Coaches, Instagram and Twitter, VB Master Coaches. All of our weekly buzz shows are on YouTube and you may access them by going directly to our Instagram account, VB Master Coaches. Click on the link in our bio and enjoy listening to leaders in our sport address current issues and trends. Now, let's go to our host, John Foreman, who will update us on his upcoming coaching conversations and an update on the Die Mavericks. However, for those that might be visiting Niagara Falls, go <laughs> 16 miles south and visit John at the home of the Mavericks. Now to you, John. <laughs> Campus is officially open, so visits are available. <laughs> might have to check in with admissions first, but uh, that's fine. Get a tour. I'm sure they'd be happy to show you around. Um, all right, thanks, Ruth. Uh, thanks everybody for for tuning in. Um, the uh, tentatively, I have a scheduled uh, conversation on Friday with a couple of guys from the Volleyball League of America to talk men's volleyball, men's professional volleyball in the state in this country. So, stay tuned. Um, you know, if, if it, when the details get sorted out, they'll definitely go up on Twitter at, v, at Coaching VB, uh, up on the I might obviously on this Facebook page if you're watching on that Facebook. And you can follow up also on my blog, Coaching Volleyball, uh, coachingvb.com. Uh, until next week, until next time, uh, enjoy your weekend, enjoy the rest of the week, and stay safe. <laughs>